Well, good morning, everyone. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Philippians chapter 1. That's where we'll be this morning. While you're turning there, let me take a minute to introduce myself. Uh, my name's Donnie Berry. For those of you who may be newer in the last couple of years and you, you may not know me uh, super well, um, our family, have, we've been part of Christian Fellowship for many, many years, going back almost 20 years. And I was a pastor here until about two and a half years ago. Um, so it's so, so fun for our family to come back and get to see so many of the people we love. We're, we're grateful to be here with you. Two and a half years ago, uh, we were sent as missionaries from Christian Fellowship. We now live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where there's a ministry called Training Leaders International. And I'm part of Training Leaders International as a representative of Christian Fellowship traveling to uh, several places around the world to train pastors in the Bible who don't have access to biblical training. And so that's a little about the work we do. I'll say a little more about that later. Uh, but just wanted you, for those of you who may be newer, just to introduce myself. But, to, but for me, on my end, I feel like this is my home coming back. And it, I love getting to preach to the people that I love at our home church and I'm really, really thrilled to get to be part of this Philippians series, Having the Mind of Christ. Michael did a great job introducing this last week. And so now we're going to pick up in Philippians chapter 1. Before we do that, if we could pray together, um, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your love for us. That we, as we come together, as we gather, we are a people loved by God drawn into relationship with the living God. What a remarkable thing that is. God, would you give us a fresh sense of, of that this morning, of who we are as those belonging to Christ, uh, of who we are as those called into the mind of Christ. God, as we spend time in your word this morning, would you share your heart, your mind with us, and let our hearts and our minds be like yours, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Philippians chapter 1. Uh, I love stories. I, it's one of my favorite things to do is read good books to our kids. I have four kids. They, uh, as they have grown and gotten to the age where we can read uh, really fun books together, I just love time spent in, in, you know, the kinds of stories where you've got good versus evil. You've got, you know, an heir to the throne that's been displaced and an evil ruler that's taken over, but there, there's hope that the, the true king will return. Like those kinds of stories, those epic adventure quests where, where there's bravery and courage and sacrifice and, and you hope for a happy ending. Like those stories draw me in. And one of the things that I find stirred in me as I get to read to my kids, I, I love how in these epic stories, every character has a part to play. And I find myself wanting to be part of a story like that, a story that matters and having a part to play. I don't have to have the main part. I don't have to be the main character. What I love in these stories is that you've got your main characters, but you have so many other characters who all have a part to play, and without them playing their part, the mission would fail, right? Everyone has an essential part to play, and it just stirs in me a desire to say, God, could I have a part to play that matters? And that's what Paul's writing about in Philippians chapter 1. If you think about a, a great story like Lord of the Rings, for those of you who are familiar with that, that's one that's pretty commonly known, right? There's, there's, Frodo, who clearly has an important part to play, but he's, even though much of the story is about Frodo, there are so many other characters that have to play their part for good to triumph. You've got Samwise Gamgee, who holds Frodo up when he can't stand on his own. You've got Gandalf the wizard. You've got the dwarves and the elves. You've got the other hobbits, Merry and Pippin, who in their own bumbling ways end up having a role that if they don't play their part, everything fails, right? These are, these are the way these stories work. And I think, I think we're meant to be drawn in to this longing 
and a sense that we are, in fact, in a story like that. We all are given a part to play, designed by God to play a part in the story that He's put us in. And so, with, with that kind of framework in mind, let's read Philippians 1, beginning in verse 3 together. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Let's pause there. Paul says he thanks God for this church. Mike gave us background last week as to when the Philippian church was started. Uh, Paul came preaching the gospel there, ends up imprisoned for preaching the gospel, right? But God moves in a miraculous way, um, shakes the jail, the, the chains fall off, but none of the prisoners escape, and the jailer ends up becoming a believer, and a church is born in Philippi. Right? And now Paul, many years later, is writing to this church saying, I thank God for you. When I Think of you, I pray for you, and it brings my heart incredible joy. That's what Paul says here. And he says he has joy because of their partnership in the gospel. The word partnership is a, it's a really important word that Paul likes to use. In this letter, it's going to be an important word that we'll see several times throughout. It, it's a word that you may be familiar with. This It's a Greek word, koinonia. Maybe you've heard that before if you've been around for very long, just about a year ago, we had a series entitled Koinonia, right? Based on Acts chapter 2 and the Koinonia, the fellowship, the partnership of the early church. Koinonia means being part of something. It can be translated in different ways. It can be translated like Paul does here, partnership. It can be translated fellowship. It, the basic idea is this idea of a group of people sharing in something together. And Paul says these Philippians have become partners, sharers. They have a part to play, and they're playing their part in the gospel. That's koinonia. It's like being part of the fellowship of the ring, right? Where you've got hobbits and dwarves and elves and humans all banding together for this common mission. That's a fellowship, a koinonia. And Paul thanks God that the Philippian believers have become partners with him. There's a sharing that they have together in the gospel. So a little more about this word, koinonia. It, it's a, what I sometimes will describe as a storied word for Paul, which just means for Paul, when he talks about koinonia, there's this whole story behind it. And the story is the story of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, which I know is one of those things, it's such a mystery that when we begin talking about the Trinity, sometimes it can just make you a little nervous, right? Like, ah, oh, that, that one really ties my head in knots. How do we even begin to wrap our heads around the Trinity? But it's so important that we continue to talk about this great mystery that God has revealed and yet we can only see and understand it in part because it's so wonderful. But we need to keep holding it before us because for Paul, the Trinity is the foundational story behind so much of what he writes. And what I mean by that is that when Paul thinks of the koinonia that he has in mind here, he has in mind a koinonia that goes back beyond the koinonia he has with the Philippians. It's before this koinonia, deeper, richer. It actually goes before creation. In Genesis 1, there's one reference for you guys who are keeping score, by the way. Genesis 1, God creates, but before he creates, God already existed in a fellowship, a community of love. Father, Son, and Spirit enjoying, delighting in one another as the Father pours his life and love into his son, who as the perfect image of the father, re reciprocates that love and joy back to the father through the Holy Spirit, right? The language, it's hard to even begin to get language for it, but there was a beautiful fellowship of love before creation ever happened. 
And sometimes I'll, I'll encourage my students, I'll say, think about the very best of relationships you've experienced. Like a person when you had a moment with them where you knew they, there was a connecting. Like they see and understand me. Like I'm known and loved in this moment. And that, like, right, we were made for that. That's a, that's a bit of a sense of this fellowship that Father, Son, and Spirit have shared eternally. The joy and delight in perfect love that they had. So for Paul, that koinonia becomes the foundation for the koinonia that we share together. We have been brought into the fellowship of the Trinity. When we believe in Christ, when we trust in Christ, we are, as, as Michael shared last week, we're united to Christ, joined to Him, joined to His life, so that we become part of the eternal fellowship of the Trinity. Right? Again, I know that's big language to try to wrap our, our minds and our hearts around, but it just means that the love the Father and Son and Holy Spirit have eternally shared, we're part of that now. We become part of that love. The Father loves us with that love. And we get to return that love to the Father. The Father knows us perfectly and we can be known and know we're known and loved and begin to experience love like we were meant to. This is the koinonia that we have because we belong to Jesus. And Paul tells the Philippians, you've been brought into that. You're part of this koinonia. And because of that koinonia, Paul says, we share in a koinonia. He and the Philippians together. So the Philippians have supported Paul financially in the work of the gospel. That's what he's talking about here when he says, you've become partners with me, sharers with me. You have had a part to play in what God has called me to do. Right? They were financial supporters of Paul. We, we read about that in Philippians 4.15. We read that you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership. Right? It's the same word again. Koinonia. No church entered into koinonia with me in giving and receiving except you only. Paul talks about that in several places. In 2 Corinthians, he mentions these believers in Macedonia who have been incredibly generous. He's talking about the Philippians. right? When they became participants in the fellowship with God that they have through the gospel, when they became part of that, the practical expression of that was, Paul, we want to be part of the work of the gospel spreading. We'll support you in the work that you're doing. And so we find with the Philippians that vertical koinonia always gets worked out in horizontal koinonia. Right? Vertical koinonia, our relationship with God, the fellowship we have with Him, always gets expressed in koinonia that we as believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, have with one another. We're part of something together. And we all have a part to play. We all share in something incredible together. So the Philippians are partners with Paul in the gospel, he says. And that brings him incredible joy. The gospel, by the way, what is the gospel that they have become partners with him in? Well, it's this good news that Paul's passion is to see this good news spread that God loves the world. So loves the world, he gave his son to rescue the world, to rescue us, to make us new, to cleanse and wash us through his death and resurrection, to restore us to relationship with God and to one another, and to make all things new. Jesus is king and he has come to restore his kingdom, right? Talk about one of these epic stories. The true king has come to reclaim his kingdom. And we're part of that. That's the gospel. And it's Paul's passion. We're going to see that throughout this letter. And Paul wants it to be our passion too. And in this great spreading of the gospel, we all have a part to play, Paul says. And the Philippians have played their part well. 
Verse 6, Paul says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God began a good work in you. And he will complete it. So what's the good work? It's the work that Paul's been talking about. This work of restoring our relationship with God. Overcoming the corruption of our hearts. Making us new. And making us a people who are part of this thing that God has called us into. Who play our parts. God has begun something in every believer. Everyone who has trusted in Christ. And because He's begun it, He will complete it. It will not fail. There's a, there's a novelist writer named Marilyn Robinson. Uh, she's a Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, maybe most well known for her novel Gilead, which is about a little small town pastor in Iowa. And it's just a beautifully written book. Uh, Marilyn Robinson is also a follower of Jesus. And one of my previous professors at seminary was a huge Marilyn Robinson fan. Just loved her writing, the way she captures truth in such a beautiful way. And he had a chance just a couple years ago to interview her on his podcast. And so I listened to the interview. It's a great little interview. Uh, One of the questions he asked her, though, he said, he said, tell me, um, you, you write about such rich things. Like, are there spiritual practices you know, spiritual disciplines, things you do to shore yourself up spiritually. That's how he asked the question. Are there spiritual practices that, that you do to shore yourself up? And she gave an answer that I thought was just brilliant. <laughs> Here's what she said. She said, you know, I'm grateful to be able to say that I don't really feel as though my spiritual state is particularly fragile. I'm not afraid of not being within the being of God. Isn't that a great little statement? She's talking about koinonia there. I am in the being of God. I've been joined to him, and that is not a fragile thing. That's what she's saying. I love that. She says, I think a lot of people act like they're carrying some little glass of nitroglycerin through life, and if they spill it, everything will explode. <laughs> like, think about your spiritual life for a moment. I, I, maybe it's different for you, but for me, like that, that captures so much. Of, it's like, if I get it wrong, God's going to be mad at me. And I know, like, I failed again. Like, it's all going to blow up now, right? And she's saying, we're not carrying nitroglycerin here. Like, if it's all going to explode. She says, I don't think that's how God relates to us, actually. And I think the fear that comes with that is something that's very disabling. Right? I loved hearing her say that. Just hearing the confidence. It's like, I am not fear fragile in my spiritual state. Now, I am fully on board with spiritual practices that draw us into God's love. That, like, I'm fully on board, and I think she would be too, but I love that in this moment, she said, you know, I'm not, I'm not in a spiritually fragile state. God has taken hold of me. That's what Paul's saying here. He has begun something in us, and he'll complete it. Isn't that good news? It reminds me of, as I listened to Michael share Jerry Colony's story last week, you remember that? At the end of the sermon, he shared some of Jerry's story of how God has met with him. And one of the things Jerry said was, God has me. He has me. Like That's the sense Jerry has now. Just this sense, he has me. I know that I know that I know he has me. On my good days and my bad days. He has me. That's the confidence that Paul expresses to the Philippians. He has you. He's got you. And he began a good work in you. He'll complete it. That's so encouraging. He who began a good work in you, Paul says, will complete it at the day of Christ. When Jesus returns, makes all things new. That's the day Paul's whole life is oriented towards and Paul has such confidence. In that day, we'll see it. We'll see that God had us all along. He goes on in Philippians 1.7 to say, it's right for me to feel this way about you, to have this confidence about you, this joy about you. It's right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace. 
That word partakers there. It's the same word. It's koinonia again. You are sharers with me. You have a part, a fellowship with me in grace. You are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. You have participants. You are participants. You have a part. You are partakers in grace with me. Right? This grace that we've been brought into. A relationship with God through His grace. And again, Paul has in view how that grace transfers to the way they're standing with Him. In His imprisonment. In His defense and confirmation of the Gospel. They're part of that because they stand with Him. They've continued to support him as he's in prison now in a hard place. And they've said, we're not going to be ashamed of Paul, even if this brings trouble on us because we're standing with him because we love Jesus too. We're going to stand with him, whatever the cost. And Paul says, because of that, I hold you in my heart. They've not abandoned him. Them, the Philippians, playing their part has enabled Paul to play his part. Even the hard part of being in prison. They've stood with him and it's allowed him to stand too. That's how it works in a a koinonia, in a fellowship. We all have our part to play that enables each of us to play the part God has given us because all of us together are standing together in a thing. Partners, partakers in the gospel, in grace, shares in it together. He goes on, verse 8, For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. That that is worth thinking about for a moment. (laughs) Paul says, I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul has affection for the Philippians. But he says it's the affection of that Jesus has for the Philippians. I yearn for you with the affection of Jesus. When you think of Jesus, do you think of him in that way? When you think of, so so put yourself in, there's Jesus, there's you, right? And how does he feel toward you? Paul says, when you think of Jesus and you think of you, you need to understand that he has great affection for you. He loves you. Right? That's been a hard one for me. That's been a hard one for me to believe that, to get a hold of that. I, I'm much more aware of my weakness, my failure, all the things I'm not that I, that I really should be. And so I know that he's probably pretty frustrated with me, disappointed in me. I've not measured up. I'm not right. Those are the things that tend to roll around in my head. And then Paul comes along or Jesus himself in the Gospels comes along and says things like this. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Live in that love. I think, really? Like you, you love me the way the Father loves you? Could that be true, possibly? That's what Paul wants us to, to feel here. He loves the Philippians, has affection for them with the affection of Jesus for them. And I would love for you to to get a sense of that this morning, just to receive that. Maybe maybe for the first time, maybe for the hundredth time, but we all have to come back around to that again and again to step back and be reminded, oh yeah, he actually loves me. He actually likes me. He's not just putting up with me because, well, he's got to be nice. And so he, no, he actually delights in you, has affection for you. And Paul feels that affection towards the Philippians because that's Jesus' heart towards the Philippians. And it's Jesus' heart towards you. Rebecca and I have done some parenting classes, parenting workshops, a variety of things through the years as we've been trying to figure out how in the world do we, uh, do we love our kids and understand our kids and um, we've also done a fair amount of counseling, um, marriage counseling, as well as just individual counseling, working through our own struggles and challenges. And one of the things that um, we've learned 
in both of those environments, the parenting classes, counseling, we've learned that we, all of us, are hugely affected by the things that happen to us in our lives, especially when we're young. Things happen, and those things tend to, uh, we carry them with us, and they affect us in good ways, but also a lot of things in, in negative ways. We all have those things. And there's, I remember one particular parenting workshop we were in, um, and they were talking about that idea, about how we're affected at young ages by things that happen to us. And they talked about two essential things that every human being needs as they grow and develop in order to be a healthy person, the kind of person that you were made to be. Those two things, they said, one is there's, a, there's this need to receive love. We have to develop the ability to receive love. And then the second thing is we have this need to give love. And the ability to do that, those two things are so important for being healthy individuals. And here's the thing. All of us struggle. We have things that happen to us that make it hard for us in both of those ways. Hard for us to receive love the way we were made to. Hard for us to give love the way we were made to. So, for example, on the receiving love side of things, we, we, because of a whole variety of things that happen to us, we might hide, right? We, we might wear masks or put up walls to protect ourselves that, that insulate us from ever actually being able to receive love for who we are. We might harden our hearts so that they won't get smashed again. Right? There are so many ways that we can try to protect ourselves, but what we end up doing is we, we lose the ability to actually receive love the way we were meant to. Right? On the other side of things, thinking about giving love, the ability to give love, we, we learn in so many ways, often again because of ways we've been hurt, we've been wounded, so we learn to look out for ourselves, to, to use others to meet our needs in unhealthy ways, Maybe, maybe to have expressions like anger or selfishness or defensiveness that are often rooted in self-protection or in the fears that actually lie beneath the surface. But because of those, we, we struggle to love the way we were made to love. We, we all struggle in different ways to receive love and to give love. We're lovers by nature. Made to be loved, made to give love. And when Adam and Eve turned from God, Genesis chapter 3, when they left the fellowship of the Trinity to go their own way, they left the fellowship they were created for, that koinonia with God. They didn't stop loving, but their love turned. Their love turned inward. Here's how Mike Reeves says it. He says, lovers we remain but twisted, our love misdirected and perverted, created to love God, we turn to loving ourselves and anything but God. Right? This, is, this is something that every one of us has experienced in some way. There's a, a word that some of the theologians through the ages, guys like St. Augustine or Martin Luther, um, there's a Latin phrase that they use to describe this phenomenon. It, it, the Latin phrase is, I've shared this before, incurvatus in se. That's the Latin phrase, which simply means curved in on ourselves, right? No longer curved outward, love for God and open to receiving his love, love for others. No, we turn inward, away from God's love, away from the love we were meant to receive from one another and away from giving love the way we were meant to. That's what this phrase means. I was talking with our kids about this a few weeks ago. We were having a conversation and this idea came up. I'm like, oh, it reminds me of this, of this thing. And I told them, incurvatu sensei. And then I had, I'm like, I'm talking to my kids here. I have to think of some way to illustrate that. So what came to me in the moment, whether it's a good illustration or not, I don't know, but it came to me. And now you get it because I haven't yet come up with something better. Um, I, I said, it's like a flower. Right, Like a flower meant to be opened up to the sun. But instead, that flower has done this. 
right? That flower, this is curved in on ourselves, no longer receiving God's love, no longer alive the way we were meant to be. And, and you can see even in relationship with one another, it's like me, not, right? not open to each other, not open to God. This is what has happened because of sin. So here's a question for you. Where have, where have you begun to wilt on the inside? Where are those places of, of pain, of hurt, that have caused you to kind of close yourself down? Maybe to God's love, maybe to the love of others. Where are those places where you, where you aren't loving others the way, you, the way you want to, but you just have things that make it hard, right? Here's the good work that God is doing, that Paul's talking about in this passage. He has begun a good work. He will complete it. And that good work is this work of returning us, uncurving us, opening us back up to God's love, to the fellowship we were made for. So Paul prays. Philippians 1.9, he says, here's my prayer. It's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Right? So let me give you another picture. Here's the picture of what Paul's praying for. Paul's praying. He says, God has begun this work, and so I'm praying that your love would abound more and more. God is uncurving you to begin to receive the light of the sun again, to receive God's love, to open up to that. And as you do that, you see there. There's an openness, right, to the sun, but also an openness to one another, right? Isn't this a much more beautiful picture than that other <laughs> picture? This is the good work God is doing in us. Love abounding as we begin to receive love from God, which happens as we are restored to the koinonia with God that we were meant for. And then that brings us into the koinonia with one another, where we're able to begin to receive and give love from one another the way we were meant to. That's the love we're made for, to participate in this. And God is committed to that work. He has begun it. He will complete it. He is committed to reordering our hearts, unbending and un uncurving us from ourselves and overcoming our selfishness and all our means of self-protection all the things that hinder love and kill joy in our lives, he is restoring us in his image so that we could love and be loved. And Paul sees it in the Philippians. They've been drawn into it. They're expressing it in their love for him. And he's praying that that would continue. That love would grow and abound. With knowledge and all discernment, he says, so that you may approve what is excellent and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. There is a fruitfulness that comes from being joined to Jesus the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus. It's that fruit of being joined to him that then begins to produce love in us. We become the loving people we were meant to be. People who are loved by God and love him. People who are loved by one another and love one another the way God created us to. God who began this good work, who has joined us through the death and resurrection of Jesus to himself, is committed to making you who he made you to be so that you can have the part that he created you for, the part of being loved by God, loving him, and then of getting to enter into all kinds of practical expressions of what that love looks like as you become partners, koinonia in the gospel as the good news of Jesus spreads and grows. So what I want to do, I want to take just a few minutes now to share a, a little piece of our story with you. One of the things that we're doing in this series, uh, as we did last week with Jerry's story, we want to share just stories that highlight um, the mind of Christ, where we, 
where we see the life of Jesus spreading, as Paul's talking about it in the book of Philippians. And so, so Michael asked me, he said, well, as you're coming and you're going to be preaching on Philippians already, why don't you just share some of your story, particularly the story of, of you guys going out as missionaries from Christian Fellowship and um, how, how that really has been a partnership in the gospel, koinonia, together. And so, so I'll, I'll give you just the very quick version uh, for time's sake. I'd love to give you the longer version sometimes because it really is a sweet story that we love to tell. But here's the quick version. The quick version, you have to go back to this picture right here um, and to an internship that I did just out of college. You see Steve Boole there on the right side and you see me um, in the middle there. Um, we've gone in opposite directions as we've aged. Steve has grown hair. I have lost mine. Uh, but this was, we were just young kids. I mean, we realize that now looking back, like, man, we didn't have a clue about anything. But we, Steve was leading an internship as one of the pastors here, and I was feeling a call to ministry. And so I jumped into that internship and for a year got to be a ministry intern at Christian Fellowship. Rebecca and I had just gotten married. Uh, I, that year was, was such a wonderful year. In the process of that year and getting to explore faith and ministry with Steve and these others, um, the pastors and elders here at Christian Fellowship and so many of you, I began to realize I love the Bible and really love teaching. I think I want to teach the Bible in some way. I didn't know what that would look like. So Rebecca and I um, began to make plans to go to seminary so I could get some training. But right before we did that, Steve sent us to Guatemala on a mission trip as part of this internship. We went with several others from Christian Fellowship who were part of that trip to go down and see John and Sharon Harvey. Um, and so you can, so John and Sharon were longtime missionaries of Christian Fellowship, founded a Celsi Ministries in Guatemala. We now, Christian Fellowship, we're still part of that with Amen and Jess Perez, the good work they're doing. And one of the things John and Sharon were doing, they were going out to remote village areas where Sharon as a nurse was bringing health care to people. And John uh, began realizing that there are churches that have pastors who've not had a chance to to study the Bible, don't understand the Bible very well, but they love their churches. They're doing the best they can. And so John just got to have a role in training and teaching them the Bible. When I went on this trip in 2004, um, Scott Williams and I got to go out with John to see the work he was doing. And I fell in love with it. I thought, I, that's what I want to do. There's such a need in other places, people that, that don't get to have re the resources we have and the teachings and the training. I, I'd love to go and teach the Bible to people who need it in other parts of the world. And so, so that led us on a long journey. Rebecca and I ended up going to seminary, um, spent four years getting some training, then came back to Christian Fellowship. I had the huge privilege of getting to be a pastor here for 12 years getting to grow up in my faith and in learning what it even means to be a pastor from such incredible, um, I mean, I just love the guys that, I, I'm amazed that they put up with me. This young kid who was so arrogant at times and knew nothing but thought I did and, and they were so gracious towards me and I grew in grace. You were gracious towards me, so many of you putting up with me and letting me be your pastor when I didn't know what I was doing. And, and in all of that, God did a beautiful thing of growing me up um, growing our family up here, we got to, you were part of the gospel in our lives. And then two and a half years ago, we'll back up a little farther than that because things started stirring in us again. That seed that got planted in Guatemala began to, to stir in us again. And we thought, man, like God seems to be doing something. Like he put that in our hearts. And I began having conversations with some of the pastors, began sitting with Mike and saying, here's what God's stirring in me. What do we do with this? And that led to partnership in the gospel. Koinonia, as Mike, as the pastors and elders, so many others of you sat with us, prayed with us. We gathered people together to pray and just to discern together what God was doing. And in the course of, of doing those things, it became clear. God was leading us to to go as missionaries from Christian Fellowship to work with Training Leaders International where we would get to go and share not only, not only the Bible, theology, but, but the grace of God that, that we have encountered at Christian Fellowship and through the Scriptures to get to go and share that with other people who don't have access to a lot of teaching and training. So all of that was a partnership. We together 
you guys discerning with us, supporting us. And then when it came time to say, okay, I think we're going to do this thing. Well, then there's the realities of, well, we have to raise support. This is a support raising role. And so the church standing with us saying, we're with you in it. So many of you saying, and this was love on your part too, saying, well, we don't really want to see you go. We're not very happy about you going. But if you're going, well, we're going with you. We're in it with you. And so all that to say, we have experienced, I think, a bit of what Paul is talking about here. We have such joy at the way our church family has loved us, walked with us, sent us out and stayed connected with us, to stand with us, support us, to love us, to send us notes of encouragement, to be part of the gospel with us. And so we have experienced the very thing that Paul is talking about. And that's just one little stream of our, you know, our little part of a, a piece of the story God's writing with us. It, I just look at every person in this room and I say, you have your story. You have your story of the part partnership in the gospel, the koinonia with God that he's called you into. And then the way that's getting expressed in your life and the people who come alongside you to encourage you and support you and stand with you when it gets hard and all of that enables you to do what you do. This is the thing we've been brought into. And so as we close this morning, I want to, I want to just share two little pieces of, of koinonia that we've experienced. Um, there's been all the, all the prayers on behalf of our family. Here's what koinonia partnership in the gospel looks like. We've gone through hard things since we've moved to Minnesota. Things have been, we just had different family circumstances that have been super hard. Uh, and you are the people. <laughs> Our church family here at Christian Fellowship are the ones we have leaned on, who have held us up, held us together, who have prayed for us, encouraged us, supported us in that. That's koinonia, partnership in the gospel. You've, I remember Jean-Claude and Nene when I was going on my first trip. I'm going to get to go to Liberia to teach. And Jean-Claude and Nene said, we are with you. We want you to go and tell those brothers and sisters you are teaching in the church where you're preaching at the, that we are praying for them and we love them and here's a gift for them. And they gave me money to take and said, this is a gift from us and from third, our third service just to share with those brothers that we're with them, those sisters. We love them. And so I got to go and present that to them. We have a picture of just getting to present that to them so they could buy Bibles for their church for members of their church, and then also so they could buy chairs for them. And so, uh, so they sent me this picture shortly after and said, here's what we did with that money, and we're so thankful. That's koinonia in the gospel, a practical expression of love because we've been joined to Christ together. And then I'll, I'll, I'll share one more story um, because you've been a part of this story. There's in that first class in Liberia two and a half years ago that I got to teach, one of my students... Um, was a pastor named Morlai who came from Sierra Leone. And we just had a team that came back from Sierra Leone with Pastor Morlai to do a training. Pastor Morlai is in the blue shirt here. Um, one of his elders in his church, Francis, next to him. I got to teach these guys the story of the Bible, how the Bible is one big story all about Jesus. And Pastor Morlai would sit in the back of the class and go, wonderful. This is so wonderful. This is just wonderful. Because he was coming from a background where he'd not been taught the gospel. He, he was preaching a prosperity message to his church because it was all he knew. And as he's beginning to taste of something different, he gets to go back to his church and now share with them something different that's beginning to transform his heart. And Pastor Morley said, could we come and do training in Sierra Leone? Could you guys come and, because I can gather other pastors and leaders together who need to hear this. And so we began having conversations about how that might look. And so we now are taking teams to Sierra Leone to teach and to train pastors and leaders there. And, and just one other cool piece of this story is that uh, Pastor Morley and his church helped lead a, a school, a K-8 through school, where they have over 200 uh, students Sierra Leone is almost 80% Muslim. It's a Muslim country. And almost all of these students, the area where they're at is an entirely Muslim area. These are students coming from Muslim backgrounds who don't know Jesus. But 
they have a good school that's providing good education. So the, the families send their students and they're getting a chance to share the gospel with students, with their families and beginning to see fruit from that. All because of lots of people playing a little part in it. I had a very small part. I just got to teach one class that began to turn his heart in a direction. The only reason I got to do that was because I was sent out from Christian Fellowship. Others at Training Leaders International have taken that on and are responsible for the training now and are going every two months to spend time with this group of leaders. And it's just lots of people playing their part, seeing the good news of Jesus spread. That's koinonia. And we're all part of it together in, in this story and in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other stories because you've been brought into the fellowship with God and with each other. And God who began this fellowship with us, <laughs> in us, will complete it. And we get to live in that confidence 